Good morning, Salam. Um, welcome. I am just about to set everything up. Um, it's wonderful to see so many of you from all parts of the world, and we're delighted that you can join us this morning. My name is Anjali Arundekar, and I am the co-director of the Center for South Asian Studies here at, at UC Santa Cruz. Along with my co-directors, Darda Newman and Mayanti Fernando, I am delighted to welcome you to the first event of our inaugural series on dissent. Now, before we begin, I want to acknowledge the land on which UCSD stands, which is the unceded territory of the Awaswa-speaking UP tribe, the Amamotsan tribal band comprised of the descendants of these indigenous peoples is working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands. I also want to remind us, as the queer indigenous scholar Joseph Pierce has done more recently, that such land acknowledgements are not the same as a relationship. Land does not require that you confirm that it exists or that it has been stolen, rather that you reciprocate the care it has given to you. Now, the Center for South Asian Studies here at UCSC, as many of you know, is a very newly founded research unit. We are now in our second year, just barely through our teething phase, focused explicitly on justice, broadly defined, economic, aesthetic, feminist, environmental, social, and so much more in South Asia and across the Indian Ocean world. We have worked very hard to curate conversations both last year and this year that both foreground and challenge continued histories of occupation, authoritarianism, as we continue to see in Indian occupied Kashmir and the foundational disposability of minoritized bodies as we have seen most recently in the horrific brutalities of Lakim Purkeri and the farmers protests marked by caste, religion, gender, and of course, labor segmentation. At the heart of our struggles here at the center remains the enduring question of the subaltern life worlds within which our collectivities survive, resist, refuse, and sometimes even surrender. Now today marks the inaugural event of our year long series on dissent. We thank you for returning and for the new friends for your extraordinary support in making our tiny little center come alive and for allowing us to carve out collectivities across Zoom oceans to educate, organize, and agitate. Every event this fall will be dedicated to the release of one or more political prisoners who continue to be incarcerated in South Asia, particularly in Hindutva India. Today, we call for solidarity and action around the imprisonment of Gulfisha Fatima and all anti-CAA, NPR, NRC protesters who continue to be incarcerated. As of today, October 15th, Gulfisha Fatima will have been in prison for 18 long, unbearable months. As such, I am delighted that we're going to begin our series today with Professor Sharika Tiranagama, who brings the very complicated, timely, and ethical reading and engagement that we hope to engender. Sharika is a social professor of anthropology at Stanford University and also president of the American Institute for Sri Lankan Studies. I have had the pleasure of working, thinking, and learning from Sharika over the years, and every engagement has been a gift. Sharika's scholarship and activism focuses on the volatile context of violence, inequality, and political mobilization. More specifically, her work in Sri Lanka, and for, the, for those of you who have not had the pleasure to read her earlier work, I invite you to do so. Her work on war and political violence in Sri Lanka explores the way 
in which militancy, political violence, and large-scale displacement becomes folded into intergenerational transmissions of memory and ethnic identification. And she argues that the most profound effects of this are to be understood principally through their impact on intimate and domestic life. I think an extraordinary intervention in many ways. Now, since 2014, Sharika has also carried out new critical work centering Dalit agricultural communities in Kerala, South India. Today, she will present some new experimental and layered work around histories of gender, memory, and militarization. Now, if you could just indulge me for one more minute before I turn it over to Sharika, and in the spirit of her talk and in memoriam, I want to end with a few lines of poetry from my father, Ramakant Arundekar, a Bahujan intellectual and poet who passed away three years ago around this time on October 17th, 2018. My Baba was a joyous Kalavant who believed in the rowdy, rousing politics of ordinary everyday descent. I leave you with two sentences from a youthful fiery speech he delivered in Marathi on caste oppression in 1949 in his capacity as the student voice for our Bahujan Samaj. Savadhan, Savadhan, Manun Thaklo Amse Man, Virod, Virod, Manun Rangle Amse Dhairya. I'll read it again. Savadhan, Savadhan, Manun Thakle Amse Man, Virod, Virod, Manun Rangle Amse Dhairya. Caution and care exhaust us through. Refusal and protest make our spirits soar. I invite you to sing in refusal, indulge me and think of my sweet Baba, read a good poem or two, eat lots of fried food in his memory. Onward and Jai Bheem. Now, a few Zoom protocols. We will, of course, have, un have muted you now. We will unmute you after Sharika's talk. Uh, we have deliberately chosen to not make this a webinar because we want to encourage uh, a sense of community and collectivity if possible. So I know Sharika, we look forward to seeing your lovely radiant faces. So if you can, please keep your videos on during the talk. And of course, after the talk, especially for the question and answer, I would invite you to just message me privately in chat and say, I wanna ask a question and I'll put you in the queue and call on you. And it will be wonderful if you ask the question yourself. And again, please keep your videos open. It's amazing how delightful it is to see a, a kind of sea of, of, of faces across from everywhere. And of course, if you have any other questions, reach out to us and Nelson Hutchinson, who's our wonderful graduate, fellow who has made so much of this possible will put registration information for the rest of our series on chat. So without further ado, Sharika, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anjali, Nelson, and the community here in Santa Cruz for inviting me. And um, I'm speaking from Menlo Park, which is the ancestral unceded lands of the Ramatush Ohlone peoples. Um, let me start by saying this talk has been very difficult to write and pitch. It's not really new work. It's a very personal reflection on, 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 um, on dissent. And so I asked for your patience in advance. And I want to shout out to my amazing sister, Narmada Tiranagama, who writes and talks about this all so much more eloquently than I can. So let me start by saying, as an academic, as Anjali said, I worked on for now nearly 20 years on Sri Lanka and political violence. And as many of you may know, the war between the Sri Lankan state and the um, LTT Liberation Tigers of Tamalulam, popularly known as the Tigers, grew in Sri Lanka's three largest ethnic groups, the majority Sinhalese and minority Sri Lankan Tamils and Sri Lankan Muslims. And Tamils and Muslims were the subject of my research. So from 2002 onwards, my research was on this 30 year war and the new process and personas it constituted. And I looked at the effects of internal displacement, militancy, political violence, and familial and generational relationships for both Northern minorities, differently positioned with regard to the state and the tigers. And, and some of you might know the primary areas of LTT control were Northern and Eastern Sri Lanka, 
until May 2009, when the civil war brutally ended and the Sri Lankan army pushed an overconfident LTT into an ever shrinking northeastern coastal strip with around 300,000 civilians that the LTT also took with them as human shields. In May 2009, the LTT leader Papar and most of the senior leadership were killed, probably executed. The official end of the civil war, though the revelations about the terrible atrocities, the war crimes committed by the Sri Lankan army continue to be revealed, even though many, in fact, already know they exist. The agony for Sri Lankan Tamils has continued. While the displaced have returned home 10 years ago, the Sri Lankan state has only expanded the army, failed to demilitarize minority areas and consistently postpone political reform. But for those of you in the audience who know me personally, what brought me to this research was in fact my own history. And the topic of this lecture series, Dissent, and my attempt to address it brought me ineluctably to a place where writing and life converge, not as concept, not as category, but as places and people of ordinary experience. My experiences of growing up with a Sinhalese father and a Tamil mother whose paths intersected as partners, but who had independent political and activist lives. Growing up as a Tamil in Northern Jaffna in the middle of war at a time when we lived under the Indian army, the Sri Lankan state and the LTT. Growing up as a child from a designated traitor's family, from a community and network of dissenters and dissidents from the Tamil left, and losing so much. There have been so many people I have lost along the way. My talk will say just a few things about dissent. I have some debts to pay. They are not to fellow academics. They are to those who I still converse with in my head, in my history, in an imagined future for Sri Lanka. As I began to write this talk for the last three weeks, I've been consumed with ghosts, stories of people, some you have never heard of, some that a few of you might have because they are notoriously dead. But to me, they were all people I knew, some I loved with all my heart. This will be a necessarily partial and personal talk. And I will talk about just three histories of the embedded nature of dissent in Sri Lanka. Firstly, the stakes of what we call dissent in Sri Lanka. Secondly, the relationship, well, four histories, I guess. Firstly, the stakes of what we call dissent in Sri Lanka. Secondly, the relationship between armed struggle, militarization and dissent. Thirdly, acts of shelter. And finally, the politics of death and living. Throughout, I hope to weave a story about the importance of the ordinariness of dissent undertaken by people often at the greatest cost and at the hardest times. This is also a story of our family, mine and others. Let me start with the stakes. In September, 1989, my mother Rajni Taranagama was teaching at the medical faculty in Jaffna University where she was a head of anatomy. She had taken a short trip in August to the UK, but had returned in time for the student's last exam. My mother and three of her colleagues had formed a Jaffna branch of the University Teachers for Human Rights. Their manuscript, The Broken Palmara, a collection of human rights reports they had compiled over the last years, as well as what would turn out to be an incredibly prescient analysis of state, the Indian IPKF, that is the Indian Peacekeeping Force, and the LTT's violence, featured throughout. The IPKF had already taken away a copy of the English version of the manuscript from our house. The LTT had gotten hold of a copy and were busy translating it into, it into Tamil for themselves. It was to this my mother returned straight home to Jaffna. We were delighted as always to have her home. And on the 15th of September, 1989, she wrote to somebody dear to her. I'll just say, I'm only sharing letters and things that are already public and stories that are already public. There's more that I will not share. So she, on the 15th of September, 1989, she wrote to somebody dear to her. Begin, quote. Sometimes I feel I want to tell you that I cannot live here any longer, to send a ticket, to go away from this tomb. I know I want to be strong. I want to call my historical strength as a woman. I want to remember and hold on to the memories of women who conquered their inability and pain. I cannot leave this small country, its belly constricted by hunger and mind blurred by pain. My head tells my emotions, hold on, hold on for one month, maybe two, the routine will engulf me. The need of others disturbs the silence of the tomb. One day, some gun will silence me and it will not be held by an outsider, but by a son 
born in the womb of this very society from a woman with whom my history is shared. They are taking all the sons of this land and making them her drums. Very soon it will be the daughters. How can this country stand? Aren't there enough dead bodies? Aren't there enough guns? Why do we squeeze the very soul's life by the barrel of the gun? I have no answers to these questions. It is tearing me with suppressed sobs and anger. If I have an answer, if we even achieve a bit of space, a small political victory, then this pain, loneliness, and depression could be handled. You know how painful it is to prove negative that women like me have the courage to stay and fight. I want to prove, not the roses, she means Rosa Luxemburg. I want to prove not the roses, but ordinary women like me have enormous courage and power that there are in the world steel women. I have fought in this world alone, held my inner self together. When that task is finished, I will be free." End quote. This letter arrived to its recipient after news of her death. My mother, Rajan Ranagam, was assassinated by an LTT hitman outside our house on the 21st of September, 1989. It was indeed a son born in the womb of Tamil society who would do it. An assassin, Bosco, was sent. He came into the medical faculty where my mother was conducting exams and where some of the LTT supporting students indicated who she was. He, waiting as per instructions until she finished marking the exams, then followed her home on her bicycle. He would later boast to others that he had roared like a lioness, asking him why he was shooting at her. Having fired the first shots and seen her fall from her bicycle, he went up close and shot her again close range through her beautiful eyes. Shots that we heard from inside our house, not knowing it was our mother dying, but knowing, knowing as we all did, that somebody was dying and that someone was always dying and disappearing in our world. After she died, the LTT began to sweep up the human rights network of activists and dissidents. These were youth activists, ex-militants, what was a steadily dwindling Tamil left and others. In memoriam, Chalvi. In memoriam, Manohar. In memoriam, Anton. In memoriam, Sivaramani, who could not live in this world anymore. When I think of these days, I remember a few days before when weary, I sat in my mother's lap, her heart against my chest, her arms loosely clasping me, our puppies nipping at my trailing fingers. And it is to that feeling I sometimes go when I need her most. In life, she was my mother who scolded us and held us in equal measure who cried night after night after collecting stories from other people who had lost their children and homes, and who at times played music and danced to try and hold on to whatever joy we could in those very hard days. When we slept, we lay as children do, entangling her with our limbs. We never thought she would be killed, and she always knew that she could be. This was always the stake of dissenting. By holding the state, the IPKF, and the LTT to account, she knew that she could die. But she also believed that she had to show, as she wrote, that ordinary people like me have, ordinary women like me, have enormous courage and power. Dissent in Sri Lanka is composed of the acts of ordinary people. My mother was from an ordinary lower middle class to upper caste Christian rural elite family. We were not a big family, not based in the capital, not with a long history of political action. She was a school teacher's daughter, but she, my aunt, and thousands of young men and women, Sinhalese, Tamil, and some Muslim across Sri Lanka, who in the 1970s and 1980s were swept up in a fervor of activism, struggle, militancy, a sense of global revolution and transformation, and then found themselves renegotiating everything they knew and held dear afterwards. Let me start with one of these threads. One of the most important features of human rights language discourse and dissent is its vernacular emergence as a category that people use to describe themselves then and now. It's, sorry, let me start again. One of the most important features of human rights language discourse and dissent, that is its vernacular emergence as a category that people use to describe themselves now and then, is the relationship to both armed struggle and state and extrajudicial violence. This is not unique to Sri Lanka by any means, but it is something that our current and voluminous accounts of either the Western or the NGO origins of the generation of human rights discourse sometimes forget to center, 
given that these are the stories that span the global south. In Sri Lanka, armed struggle was understood as a primary form of activism and transformation, as it was imagined by the Southern Sinhalese JVP, first in guerrillist form in the 1971 uprising and is in its ethno-nationalist form in the late 1980s. Also the smaller non-JVP left sprinter Sinhalese militant groups or the multiplicity of Tamil militant groups across the political spectrum, from the explicitly left wing such as EPR left to the ethno-nationalist LTT and Tello. State violence, incarceration, and the growth of shadowy state paramilitary forces constantly up the ante. It was from the fallout of this heavy form of militarization that people began to emerge calling themselves human rights activists and dissidents. From a, and, and these dissidents and activists from a very wide political spectrum emerged as those targeted by military actors, both state and militant. In most cases, though not all, Tamil and Sinhalese had themselves been part of armed struggle movements. Dissent, thus as it emerged, was integrally concerned with first these pathways that militarization of political struggles had taken, and because there were pathways that people themselves had undertaken, dissent emerged not in a moment, but in many moments. It emerged in people's lives, not from their beginnings, but part of their journeys through their lives. Dissent became about voicing doubt, about disrupting the certainties of one's own political life and personal beliefs. No one came to human rights work or to dissent with so-called clean hands. A belief in armed struggle was part of my own family history. My father at 19, the first person in his village and family to go to university, was incarcerated in 1971 after a protest where a policeman died and all who were present were promptly jailed. He was part of a generation of young Sinhalese who believed fervently in revolution. He'd initially been part of the JDP, a Maoist-inspired insurrectionary group, but had left long before his incarceration over what he believed even in 1971 was a worrying stance towards ethnic minorities. In my father's village, the school teacher, a lifelong member of the Communist Party, George Ratnayaka, had stopped him and other children in their village when they were called by the Communist Party to participate in a rally against a government packed with Tamil political parties. My father never forgot what George Ratnayaka would tell them, that despite George being a supporter of the Communist Party, he did not agree with racism. This injunction against racism shaped my father's life in left politics. George Ratnayaka was killed brutally by the JVP in his second uprising in 1989, as he descended from a bus going home to his village. My mother was beside herself. My father was already in jail when the JVP rose up against the state in April 1971, and he soon fell into the category of thousands of young Sinhalese men imprisoned by the state for re-education. He was inside for 4.5 years, four and a half years, most of them in solitary confinement and severely tortured. Eventually, he was fully acquitted. My grandmother, my Atama, and his next brother along, then 17-year-old Daya, who died um, last month, never gave up, though they were from a poor royal family, poor, poor rural family. When he was in prison, Daya and Atama visited him faithfully. Daya wrestled and negotiated with lawyers as a teenager. Eventually, my father was acquitted. After jail, he came out and finished his interrupted degree. The day after his final exam, he was abducted from the university boarding house by the police. In his second arrest, he never made it into the prison system, but into Sri Lanka's shadowy emerging extrajudicial state. Since that time in the 1970s, because of the state's brutal repression of Southern Sinhalese insurrections, its conventional war against the LTT and a counterinsurgency against Tamils at large, Sri Lanka has seen an expansion and transformation of the army, navy, and police, including the creation of the paramilitary police, the special task force. State forces have been given license to detain, torture, and kill those it suspects of being terrorists, often outside of the judicial system of formal prisons. His appearances and the gray network of camps and cells characterize a large part of political violence in Sri Lanka. In prisons, one is visible. In gray areas, one disappears. My father experienced both. His second arrest, he didn't officially exist. He was in police camps, 
the fourth floor of the CID headquarters in Colombo, and all the other places that Sinhalese and now predominantly Tamil and Muslim inmates disappear into and never to be seen again. When no one could find him, Sunila Abhisekara, a powerful activist who helped so many in her life in these sorts of practical and important deeds, in memoriam Sunila. Sunila was young then, but by finding him, she proved he was taken by the state and still alive. My Atama, who had come to the capital and patiently searched from police station to police station, then utilized her power as an older Sinhalese mother. She refused to leave until she could see her son and know that he still existed. My father sat in his cell in the dark, not wanting her to see his disfigurement and shame, but she sat patiently in the light, crying but quietly being there with him as his mother. This is life in Sri Lanka's gray zone. Even now it is families, the families of the still disappeared who refuse to forget their children and refuse to deny their existence. When my father finally came out this second time, he went to the north, the newly set up University of Jaffna, where Tamil and Sinhalese radicals were gathering. He went to stay with my aunt Nirmala, who he had never met, but who was part of that circuit. For all of these young people, it was revolution. It was armed struggle against the state. My mother, younger, but still caught up, was also enthusiastic. So then when I talk now about dissent, it's th this, this dissent as it emerged came from this bloody fallout of the state's intense campaign against Tamils and Sinhalese radicals. But then as I'm going to talk about now, as also the intense fallout of the ethno-nationalist turn the Tamil militancy and the JVP took, which ended up in mercilessly purging and killing Tamil and Sinhalese traitors, most often from the left. And it's to this latter that I now turn. When I began my own research, which was partly about political violence, I knew because of my own history that the place to investigate political violence was within families. 1986 is a critical year among Sri Lankan Tamil communities and militancy. The 1983 anti-Tamil riots, like the 1977 anti-Tamil riots before them, had seen a surge of young Tamils into the multiple Tamil militant movements. Decades of anti-Tamil discrimination and riots by the Sri Lankan state and the majoritarian Sinhalese community had soured many Tamil belief, Tamils' belief in parliamentary redress and sent them to militancy instead. This was true across the globe in the 70s and 80s, this kind of turn to militancy and armed struggle. Every Tamil family had a connection to one or another militant movement. Of the many groups, the big five were EPRF, PLOT, TELO, EROS, EROS, and faithfully the LTT, one of the smallest. It was only around 3,000 or so in the mid-80s to the thousands in the other movements, but it was the most secretive and militarily well-organized. As the military movements began internally purging their members by the mid-1980s, in 1986, the LTT also declared war on the other movements, and began to take their weapons and arrest and kill those who resisted. Of those who were not taken, thousands and thousands of young Tamils now in their 50s and 60s. So a disproportionate number of Sri Lankan Tamils from that generation you meet will share this experience, both women and men. These thousands of young people were reabsorbed into their families. Their families now reconstituted themselves around these secrets, around these young people. Dissent, you see, is an intimate affair. It is learned in Sri Lanka through the surge of feeling in movements as well as their disappointment. It is learned through the cruelty and care of kinship, the families that place enormous obligation on young people to be educated, to marry, to provide dowry, to obey, and yet also in the last instance, are the only institutions to hold them and reabsorb them and to never forget them. Tamil families, gendered, gerontocratic and hierarchical, but produces both the antithesis of militancy and as the refuge from war. And yet are also themselves shaped and constituted by their relationship to militant recruitment, their keeping of political secrets and their own entwining of political and familiar transmission. In the mid 1980s, my mother, a doctor was doing a PhD in biological anthropology in Britain. My sister and I were with our grandparents in Jaffna and then sent to my mother for the last year and a half. My grandparents had been desperate for my mother to leave the country 
to escape from the intense surveillance my family was under. My eldest aunt Nirmala and her then husband Nithi Anandan had been arrested in 1982 under the Prevention of Terrorism Act for aiding the LTT. One of my sister's earliest memories was seeing Nithi being taken into a van by the Sri Lankan security forces as they raided my grandparents' house. One of my earliest memories is visiting Nirmala in prison in Colombo, an orange drink in hand, the door slamming after me, holding onto my mother's hand, terrified. My father accompanied us. It was a prison he knew well as a former inmate. Nirmala and Nithi were some of the few prisoners that survived the 1983 riots. In the prison, Sinhalese prisoners were released into the Tamil prisoner cell to kill them. Nirmala, the sole female prisoner, was surrounded by women chanting that they were out for tiger blood. While Nithi escaped with the men breaking out, Nirmala was transferred and then was also broken out of jail. She came to see us before she left for India. I remember that too. Once in India with the LTT, she came up against the vicious militarism of the LTT and the chain of command which permitted no dissent. She left publicly. That was the beginning of our lives as a traitor's family. My mother, then in London, had also become disillusioned with the LTT. And that was when we went at four and six to live in Britain with my mother. The war went on unendingly at home. Tamils constantly left the country. My mother finished her PhD. The day after her defense, we were going home, home to Chapna, home to war, home to where my mother felt that she was needed when other professionals were leaving. We returned in 1986, but after the cross war between the militant movements. We returned in the midst of constant probation, the attempts to shut down services like Jaffna Hospital. In 1987, the Sri Lankan state began their military campaign, Operation Liberation, where they bombarded their own Tamil citizens mercilessly to retake the peninsula. In our garden, just like every other house around us, we built a bunker, sheltering in them as the bombs crashed down on us. We never knew if we would make it. Tamils begged India to rescue us. We thought that the Indians would be our saviors. And when the Indian peacekeeping force came to enforce the new accord, it was hoped that the Indians would be our bulwark against the Sri Lankan state. Then the LTT and the IPKF went to war and the IPKF began their all out onslaught. We started calling them the Indian people killing force. When the Indian Army came into Northern and Eastern Sri Lanka, they came with their allies from the banned Tamil militant movement, smarting and humiliated by the LTT and enacting their anger on the local population. In turn, for conservative Jaffna, the violence of groups like EPR left, so enhanced by local caste anger, that it was the left wing EPR left who was associated with being low caste and Dalit that was lording it over them. Upper caste turned to the ethno-nationalist LTT and its upholding of discipline, chastity, the nation, that the group that promised them a restoration of conservative values. It was what the LTT had hoped for. They emerged as the only defenders of Tamils as they and the IPKF and their allies fought it out. The LTT and the IPKF fought in our streets, through our homes, hospitals, schools, temples. Everything was fair game. Everyone was fair game. Rape, killing, and bombardment were second nature to the IPKF. The LTT, in turn, fostered high damage encounters in civilian areas for their international campaigns. There are many stories about my mother and the network of young activist students and a few other academic, that all, the, the many stories about all these activities they took part in. They put on plays. They set up Purani, a women's center that took in a combination of displaced women, those who had been abandoned by their families, as well as, as well as those who were choosing to live in a women's community. My mother collected endless stories documenting atrocities. She went to Indian army camps to get out students who had been detained. When the Indian army announced the university was to be closed and their takeover of Jaffna in 1987, my mother and other academics heard it from the vice chancellor on the radio. While most stayed away, my mother and a few others refused to accept that the university could be closed by any, that any university should be closed or could be closed by any military force. She went back and she and a couple of others cleaned up the destroyed offices and recommenced teaching in huge classes. The university meant something to my mother. It was a responsibility for teaching and for young people. When her students were taken, including LTT ones who later participated in the information network, 
that led to her death. She went and fought to get them out. At night in our house, the adults piled up tables and beds on top of each other. And when the bombs came and the shells whistled, we three children, my sister, I and my cousin slept underneath. They hoped these strange structures could break the bomb's impact on us. The Indian army had taken over the house next to us as a camp. At night, they marched up and down the road, their boots loud. You weren't allowed to show a light or make a noise, otherwise they would throw a grenade at the house. And they did indeed throw frequent grenades. As we lay and quivered in fear, sometimes playing cards, my grandmother telling us stories in hushed voices, my mother would grow impatient. She would light the paraffin stove and make the children food. She showed us every day that I knew her, that in the worst of circumstances and the worst of times, that she was very afraid but unbowed. We needed one adult who held themselves together as our worlds fell apart, and she was that adult for us. My grandparents provided the love that held our large family together through the pain, in memoriam of Nanda. If I have told you the story of my mother who reopened the university to teach, let me tell you the story of another friend of mine who died three years ago and one of, was one of the most brilliant and humble academics I know, Professor Shahul Hasbala. Hasbala from Manna. In 1990, across the five districts of the Northern province, the LTT evicted its entire minority Muslim population. In the East, the ethnic minority Muslims were a powerful electoral constituency and the militants had previously both stoked anti-Muslim feeling, but also negotiated with them. In 1990, the LTT decided it would indeed instead turn on Muslims and began attacks in Eastern Sri Lanka. The Northern Muslim populations were far smaller and more vulnerable. In October, the order came. Every Muslim was to leave the Northern province in 24 to 48 hours. In Jaffna, Muslims summoned to a meeting at Osmania College. Those I interviewed recall that Karikaman, who pronounced the order, did not even get off his motorbike while telling them they had two hours to leave. As Muslim families left, they were stopped at numerous checkpoints by the LTT, who stripped them of their jewelries, land deeds, and goods. This was across the northern province, with Manna, the largest Muslim population, at around 38,000. By the end of October, the north had no more Muslims. 70 to 80,000 of them were forced to leave most ending up in refugee camps in North Central Putulam district with others in other refugee camp areas that were essentially eventually sent to Putulam. Professor Hasbala, whose family was forced to leave Manna, began to organize. He and a team of others put together a survey and went from family to family. Around 12,000 surveys were collected among Northern Muslim families, listing names, deeds, asset loss, and an open question that people love answered in the flush of that moment of loss. What did they want from that future? From their future, what had they lost? In each of these surveys that people wrote in the end remains with me still. There are lines of disappointment, loss, bitterness, and bemusement. In my interviews, one woman I call Nachia told me of how she questioned the LTT cadres who came to take the keys of her house. Quote, is this the house that your father's mother built? You have to ask, she told me. I'm asking them straight. Is this the house your father's mother built? Is this the house the leader of the tigers built? Have you come all this way to take from us, us who built this house, this threshold, who brought these things? Now, if you want to go and catch a country, you do that. Take the country. Who would come and ask from people these things? End quote. Those books of surveys, each book a different district, collected soon after the eviction, remain as a testament to this terrible act. And it is a labor of love by a group of people who knew in that moment that something had to be recorded. Haspala, over many years since 1990, never lost that commitment. He carried out every year a different piece of research on the North, on the East, on the South, that testified to his commitment to minority communities, Tamil and Muslim, and to the future and fate of Muslim communities in Sri Lanka, trapped within Singhala and Tamil majoritarianism. In memoriam, Hasbala, geographer, social scientist, who first introduced me to Puttalam, who I met over many years and who gently and inexorably guided so many of us along his own deeply felt journey. When I last saw him in 2018, we had coffee and talked about the book he was writing on Jaffna Muslims, the one he had already released on Musali 
and the harassment of Muslims returning to the North Central and Mana regions, and the research he was hoping to do, documenting shrines across the country which were now being abandoned. abandoned. He had so much left to do, and so did my mother. They died in different ways, but there were two academics whose intellectual life was shaped by the terrible events they were part of and rose to action around. If this was an integral part of struggles in Sri Lanka, let me turn now to another history of dissent in Sri Lanka, that of shelter. Some of these dissenters you will never know. They won't work in NGOs, and maybe you won't even know that their acts of secrecy, compassion, and shelter have kept so many alive. Maniam, Manianna, was a bookseller and a member of the Peking branch in his youth, an anti-caste activist. My grandfather bought newspapers from him. He emanates calmness, a sense of purpose, and an ordinary form of neatness that I know well from many older men. Among his many political acts was to give shelter to a friend, a UTHR activist fleeing Jaffna after my mother's assassination. Manianna kept him safe and managed to get him out of the North. Subsequently, he was arrested and tortured by the LTT. That neat man. I had nightmares after we talked. Ordinary acts of shelter carrying with them enormously dangerous stakes crisscross histories of dissent in Sri Lanka. There were networks of houses where ordinary people hid political activists, moved them from house to house. Sometimes the house was openly defiant. In the case of families and villages, they protected their ex tamil militants from the LTT in 1986. And this is especially true in Dalit and Panjama areas in 86, who rallied to hold off the LTT raids of other militants. But most of the time, however, it was secrecy undertook at enormous cost. Shelter was a history I knew well, because before my mother died, our experiences were shaped by my father, Singhalese father's life underground, as we were taught to say. There have been so very many journeys I have undertaken with my father as an adult, where he has pointed out to me safe houses in which he has stayed. The JVP was not only engaged in combat against the state, but it was also busy killing singular leftists not associated with them. The state was even more brutally suppressing the JVP and also mobilizing left um, and armed activists who were threatened by the JVP into a paramilitary force called the Black Cats. In the 1980s, as neither a JVP or a Black Cat or with the state, my father was a marked man. When we saw our father once or twice a year, either because he came to Jaffna, we made it to Colombo. We had to navigate this fear, suspicion, and the act of grace that was sheltered. We were not brought up to think my father would survive. I remember walking with him and freezing when my sister and I saw a policeman across the road. I can never remember not being scared of the police as well as the army. When I first went to Sri Lanka to do my fieldwork in the queue for my residence visa, the clerk examined my British passport with my father's name as my emergency contact. You are Dayapala Tiramangama's daughter, he asked me. Yes, he looked at me. I am from the next village from him. I hid him in my house when he was on the run. He stamped my passport with a residence visa, briskly walked me through the office around the desk and sent me off. 10 minutes for a visit that would normally take hours. In 2018, as my father and I drove to see my aunt Sumadhi's partner, the filmmaker Papi Raja in hospital. He showed, he stopped, my father stopped at two safe houses, one, two of many that Papi had arranged for my father in the 1970s to show me, in memoriam Papi. These six secrets activated, not in speech, but in space. Audrey Rivera was the owner of the house in which my father most often dwelt, in a secret house in the back annex. Audrey was from a Sri Lankan Portuguese burger background, a socialist, a Christian, an ordinary bank clerk who saved the lives of the Tamil and Singhala left for decades. She unflinchingly housed in her little house in Dehivala, Tamils wanted by the LTT, Tamils who needed a place to stay in Colombo, fearing the state, Singhalese hiding from the JVP and the state. My grandfather visiting Nirmala in prison, stayed in a house in Colombo. My aunts fleeing the war after the LTT began killing and arresting student activists stayed with Audrey. My father lived on and off in a secret back room in the back of Audrey's house. Audrey was a, one, along with one other, trusted by all the UTHR human rights network. Possibly, Audrey is one of the most well-known by those who survived, 
and the most unknown by those who look for activism in the well-known NGO and international scene. Passionate, fiery, determined, and humble, Audrey lived a life in accordance with her political and personal beliefs. She had on her desk displayed next to the Bible, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's letters from, letters from prison. Audrey died this August in her old age and her life and courage spans much of these histories, I tell you, Tamil and Sinhalese. In memoriam, Audrey. Who did people have to shelter? If in the 1970s and 1980s, early 1980s, it was those who first engaged in armed struggle and then fled it, then towards the end of the 1980s and 90s, it became those who were documenting human rights violations and disappearances. Document, documenting was in itself an act of dissent because just remembering was dangerous enough. It is from remembering that we have been able to document the patterns of torture inflicted by the Sri Lankan army to try and ask for news of those who have disappeared into camps. In memoriam, Kohamuti, one of my favorite people in the world, I will never forget you, disappeared by the state in 1990. I will always remember you. We only came to know of the LTT's traitors present to those incarcerated in them. In 2005, I met an older man, formerly a bu bureaucrat, but also a left-wing activist. He was imprisoned by the LTT in one of their most extensive traitors prisons, Kunnahil. Because he was a bureaucrat, he was also made to accompany carders and record inmates' crimes and ransom requests from their families for those in prison for not paying tax, as well as those in prison for political reasons who were never to see the light of day again. It is because of men like him who remembered what I cannot even now want to remember and wrote a pamphlet in Tamil when he was finally released that we know about what went on. We know about these because Sridharan and Rajan who continued through UTHR after my mother's death to hold the human rights network together and write and document in their hundreds of reports. There are others I do not name, but I remember you all. I can go on like this, but I think the point about the stakes of dissent, the relationship to armed struggle, and the ordinariness of the acts even done when it is unclear what the future holds are clear. Maybe now, post-war, we have to reflect upon what this history brings us to. Since the 1990s in Sri Lanka, the major political ethos that infuses policies in speech is the fostering of national security as a duty of ordinary citizenship. In Colombo, local Sinhalese are enjoined to report on Tamil's Sri Lankan police and state. Tamils had to carry police certificates with them with a known address. Found in an ad address not on their certificate, they would be arrested. The state fostered a sense of fear that made informing on Tamils the very essence of a responsible person. Since the end of the war and the LTT's demise, the Rajapaksa regime continues to wield national security as their preeminent electionable win. They turn now to also criminalize and target Muslims as well as Tamils. Currently, hundreds of Muslims are imprisoned on trumped up accusations under the PTA without being charged after the Easter bombing. Afnaf Jazim and Hijaz Hezbollah, for example, are two. Tamils and Muslims are still constantly held as necessary surveillance subjects, and the government justifies its corruption and mismanagement by anti minority discourse whenever needed. Thus, in this post war era, dissent is now shaped by the refusal to see national security as the only form of relationship between us. Dissent for Tamils was shaped also by the refusal to let ethno nationalism stifle the belief that there had to be something better for Tamils, that we deserve democracy, not military rule. And any real future dissent in Sri Lanka has to be shaped by the willingness to understand and fight for Muslim struggles in complex rather than rhetorical ways as the minority of two overwhelming majorities who are ever willing to turn their back on, on anti-Muslim state and community action. This is a real struggle. To my fellow Tamils in diasporic communities who speak of the LTT's Elam and then talk of Islamophobia in the West in the same breath, I want to remind you that in Sri Lanka, anti-Muslim sentiment found in all the militant groups was raised to the level of ethnic cleansing politics by the LTT. The LTT's Ulam, they told us, was a Tamil Ulam, a Tamil-only homeland with Muslims ejected. And Ulam became an erasure of centuries of multi-ethnic life. 
When a Sinhalese academic asked me why Thomas cannot forget the atrocities committed against them so they can all move on. This is in the context of a conversation about 1983. I felt so much anger, but that is also what we Tamils want Muslims to do. So let me return now, finally, to the right to mourn, which is in such question in Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka, we have lost so many people. Families have tried desperately to hold on to their loved ones. Under the LTT control, the LTT controlled the right to mourn. They labeled all their assassinations as killings of Tamil traitors. They only called LTT cadres martyrs, not those who died from other movements or even civilians killed throughout the war. For their own cadres after 1990, they disallowed family funerals and rites. They would be remembered only by their cadres names and families could only mourn them on Great Heroes Day for the glory of the LTT, not for their own. So many Tamils could not be remembered because the LTT not only killed and disappeared us, but because it, like the state, decided who could be mourned and who could not. It was not possible to speak of those openly killed by the LTT or even to speak of those who had died in the war or those from other militant groups as martyrs if they were not LTT. Along with these restrictions on mourning went a celebration of death. As Tamils and Muslims faced the violence of the Sri Lankan state, we were only offered by the LTT a politics of martyrdom. In the Kittu Memorial Park in Jaffna, near where I lived, the LTT put up seesaws in the shape of machine guns for us children. It ran recruitment sessions in schools. After 1990, its public days celebrated the death of LTT cadres as the ultimate sacrifice, the Great Heroes Day, the Black Tigers Day, which was to celebrate the suicide cadres. Many of the ex LTT cadres I interviewed also questioned the facts of their lives, questioned why their lives were always forfeit. What were they supposed to do except die? And when they left the LTT, they were either called traitors or they, or they were dragged back forcibly to fight. In the 90s, the LTT started cutting the girls' recruits' hair close and short, so they were spotted when they tried to flee. But we mourned, we mourned every day. Sometimes the dead and the disappeared are not there, but other times we speak to them continually. Right now in Sri Lanka, we do not have the right to mourn as Tamils and Muslims. In 2009, thousands and thousands of civilians died, trapped by the LTT, bombarded by the state. And you may have seen this in the news, how more than 300,000 ended up in this coastal strip, illegally and brutally bombarded by the state, who even bombed the zones they declared safe. And they were stuck in place because the LTT refused to leave let them leave and shot at those trying to run away. And over 40,000 or more, we don't even know, died in a few short months. About untold war crimes committed against civilians and cadres by the victorious army. And when you travel up the A9 towards Jaffna, you can see the regiment's name splashed by camp after camp. Thomas know which name. I cannot see the Gajaba regiment sign without printing. Those new and old conscripts into the LTT who died horribly to buttress a force only invested in protecting its leadership at the cost of all. But I asked some after the battle why they had traveled along with the LTT in that horrible last chance. They answered simply, we went with our children. One family I knew followed to hold on to their daughter who was an LTT Kada. In the end, the father and two brothers died, the only family remaining, the mother and her two daughters. We hold on to those we love. 285,000 Tamils were interned by the state for a year in camp before being allowed to return home. Young people, older people too, were taken out of the camps and in a variety of places across the North and East suspected of being LTT. Hundreds surrendered, disappeared. Their parents still asking the state as to their whereabouts. We don't know where they are. Now no mourning of those lost and those disappeared can be done in Sri Lanka. No mourning of those last battles is allowed because the state equates that loss to mourning the LTT and mourning is banned as a matter of national security. But those deaths, those disappearances, those families do not go away. In these COVID times, the Sri Lankan state has spread rumors blaming Muslim minorities for the spread. For months until February 2021, they forcibly cremated Muslims who died in hospitals were suspected of COVID-19, despite no scientific evidence that required this violation of burial rights. Only after outcry did they stop the forced cremations and institute a common burial place in a, in a remote area in Sri Lanka. Now Muslim families have to travel to Uttamangali to mourn and bury their loved ones in ways that put all the love and care we take in preparing those who die into question. 
how can we indeed ever find our lives valued if our deaths are not being able to value by those who love them? In Sri Lanka, we elected and re-elected those who are at the heart of this denial and who are the architects of killing, incarceration, and disappearances across the country. So finally, in a country that has known so much death, what is it to live? My friend Abhi Rasaratnam, as a young school girl in Chindukali Girls School in Jaffna, grew impatient in one of these recruiting sessions at school. She openly questioned the LTT cadres running their speeches in school. So if we are all supposed to be dying for Tamil Nulam, then who's going to be around to live for it? For so long, Tamil politics has been warped by a politics of sacrifice in which dying was a constant possibility, valorized the center of our lives. To survive was to feel guilty, to feel lesser. Death and sacrifice became central to both nationalism and dissenting. To die was to be honorable, to live. Well, what was it to live and survive? The stakes of the LTT have fallen away. Nostalgia can now flourish in the absence of violence, but their politics continues to shape how minorities in Sri Lanka imagine struggle against the state. And that is why it is important to remember, because life matters. Dissent in Sri Lanka then finally is about life. It is about refusing the politics of martyrdom, necessary sacrifice, national security, heroes, and the triumphant celebration of, of death. It is about survival. Every Tamil I interviewed felt guilty about surviving with so many of us that we knew were dead. I feel guilty now as I did then. To survive seemed like a failure when so many have lost. But this guilt comes out of a history and a politics that placed death as the first stake rather than the last. And where lives were so cheap, we didn't always stop to count our dead. My mother should be here with me now. Her life should not be, have been taken. I say this knowing that for every Sri Lankan in the audience, some version of this statement is true about a loved one. I, like everyone else, have debts to pay to those who cannot be remembered. To mourn is to love, to hope, to have conversations that do not end, to dream a place for those long gone. To return to my mother's words, she wrote in one letter, in this war, to die was your right, to live your privilege. End quote. On another occasion, she wrote, we will survive. I hope we survive. Life is much more work than just fluffed out like a candle flame. My mother's task is completed. She is free, but we are not. And that is what I want to leave you with. Dissent is, in Sri Lanka is believing in ordinary life. That we, Tamils, Muslims, Sinhalese, Malayana Tamils, Burgers, Malays, and other minorities deserve to be more than spectators in our own history, and that a politics without life at its center ends up only counting our dead. Thank you. Please join me in unmuting yourselves and, and sharing our, um, our, I have no words, Sharika, that was fierce, lyrical, moving, illuminating, and energizing. And I think that's um, I have a lot of questions for you, but but I am grateful that that you um, used our sort of platform to share this this um, sort of new work, and and I know I, I already have a lot of people who have questions, um, but again I want to thank you for it. And as I said, it was both illuminating, enlightening, and lyrical. Um, so I'm going to call on on people, um, and again as I said. We try to create, um, you know, a kind of bertak, a, a feeling of each other, a gathering. So if you feel able to please, you know, turn off, I mean, turn on your videos so we can see you. And uh, those of you who have written to me, I will call on you. If you don't feel comfortable asking your question, of course, I will ask it for you. But I know Sharika would enjoy seeing you and, and having it come from you. So I will uh, hold off my question because I, I know there are more learned people in the audience who have things to say. So let me start first with Indrani, Indrani Chatterjee, who is somewhere here. And then I have Vilashini and then I'll call the next people. Um, if, if the people who are asking questions could do me the favor of just telling us who you are. We have, uh, we have comrades from academic spaces, activist spaces, familial spaces. Um, so just share whatever you feel is relevant about you. Thank you so much. <laughs> 
Indrani, take it away. Thank you, Anjali, and thank you so much, Sharika. Um, I had to basically stay on off video because every word was making me cry. And the reason I was crying <laughs> is because everything you described <laughs> about that struggle reminded me of 1970s in Eastern India and Northern Bengal, particularly. And I'm sure there are many others here who can talk about this at great length, but I'm trying to compose myself enough to ask you a question that will allow us all to think beyond the pain we are inheritors of. The question that I have struggled with is this, is there something new to be thought through, particularly from the experiences of the global south, where we think about families in historical time as particular forms of the political that are not quite commensurate with the theories of the political that we have all inherited. And I struggle with this issue, both as a historian of family and kinship and networks of safe households, shelter giving households, um, precisely because the way the family is defined in our theoretical universes are far more limited than the capacious ones in which the experience that you are narrating are set. So I just wanted to throw it out there and ask if this is a moment in which we should begin to re-historicize, re-theorize, uh, the uh, capaciousness and the definitions of family, kinship, and the political differently. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Indrani. And um, I'm, I'm not glad, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad that there's something in it that could also speak to your own experiences. And in the interest of family and kinship, I just want to um, it's not often this happens, but <laughs> many members of my family, including my father, my two aunts, and my uncle are all on this talk, so I just want to start off with sending out some love to them for, for a start, because this, so I'm glad they're all alive, that's why I didn't mention them in, the, in, the, in memoriam, but I want to send out, you know, some love to, to them as well, and also for my father for letting me talk about it. Um, as well. Um, and and Indrani, I, I, I agree with you entirely. And that is actually how my, um, my work in a way began was to try and rethink the ways in which um, kinship and family was thought of in relation to political um, struggle as something that was affected by, but not, ne but not necessarily um, transformed through and vice versa also that, in fact, what I found when I was trying to do work on dissent or on um, political history, so that it was, it was in fact within the families that all these secrets were kept. And that it was actually a much better place if we were going to do that in, in the kind of atmosphere that Sri Lanka was where secrets had to be kept. But if you were going to do research on political violence, that was actually where you had to, to go to really think about what had happened. But you know, the, the whole thing about thinking about it through kinship and families is of course, then you do have to reckon always with the cruel and hierarchical and, you know, intensely gendered um, caste um, po politics of families, right? So, you know, it, it's a very distinct structure of recognition and affirmation and care and cruelty. So I think it gives one, it, it's never a simple, object it just you know it's never this simple thing oh well families are this thing that they they cast their own form, formative i mean because of the nature of what uh, the kind of power structure that families are constructed around 
they also do something to political struggles seen from prioritizing and centering kind of kinship struggles. So I try to, to do both of that in my work, actually in Sri Lanka and also um, in India, where I try to follow um, in my work in India, Patricia Hill Collins is insistent that if you ground the family and the household as a sort of intersectional paradigm, you actually get to talk about structures in a way that both centers women, but also um, actually is about how, the, how forms of structure and privilege and politics are inherited and transmitted. So that's a very short answer, but I'm in entire agreement with you. Thank you, Sharika, and thank you, Indrani, for opening up the question. Sharika, I had a question, and you don't have to answer it, but I just want to throw it in as we move forward, and I'll develop it as we go along. I was very interested in the afterlives of dissent, because in many ways, I heard your navigation of the in memoriam genre as a place of both um, reflection on the past, but also to speak about, and you, you talked about the inheritance of loss, but you also talked about the inheritance of a vocabulary of dissent. Um, so I wanted to hear a little bit more about it because I think it follows from what Indrani was saying as well. The family, in, even in your narration, is a mutable form, right? It's not, I think the family, I mean, as someone who works on histories of sexuality, the family is always discarded as a normative structure that we want to jettison, but you're sort of also recoding the idea of the family, not as a conventional normative form that just absorbs these new forms of incursions, but is in itself always already non-normative in the context of violence and militarization, right? Um, anyway, whatever you fancy, because I know there are other people, but I did want to ask you about the afterlives, because I... I, you know, in as much as the, the kind of lyricism and affect of your paper was there, you were also trying to get us to think with it and not just sit in it. So I wanted to find a way to, to get you to talk about it. So if you fancy, otherwise we move on. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the funny thing about giving an emotional talk, if afterwards you're like, oh, oh no, I have to carry on and do Q&A and have intelligent things to say. <laughs> And I do, I hope I can come up with something um, because I, I, when I started writing the talk and I knew it was going to be personal, I precisely did think, well, but how, what do I have to say, in fact, about dissent when I don't have to, when I can, when I can step into a place where it's only with, where I'm writing this way, it's not me writing about somebody else writing about something else, but this is it, to assume a place with the, and I, you know, in my talk, one of the things I thought about that the dissent itself was an afterlife of armed struggle. And when I read all these books on human rights or all the critiques, that is something I feel that could be there, but is rarely there if you don't look at the global South as a place where actually human rights and dissent really ma matter. But what, what histories do they come from? What do histories do they come from? They, I mean, they come from what Indrani said, like from 19... 70s in India or in, you know all, in all of these places they have these embedded vernacular lives I but, but I'm using vernacular in a, in a wrong way I don't mean universal versus particular I mean that they have their own emergence and this emergence is rooted in our histories which have to do with particularly the 60s and 70s and the 80s as very important times and so the and that's what I meant in the talk about dissent being something that nobody came to with their hands clean. It wasn't like um, it, people came to it through their own stories of also being involved in many in many things, including militancy. And but and it was about rethinking everything about your own life, not just about other people's lives. And certainly that was true of my mother as well. You know. So and I and I want to kind of honor that rather than this kind of story that you can only do dissent or human rights in this completely innocent mode where we don't pretend that anyone has any political histories, but to honor how it is that people came by their convictions and the kind of range of acts. So um, that's why I pick out shelter as well, because I think it's so very little talked about shelter and it doesn't 
come across as this big thing you do, but it's sometimes the thing that holds on to the life itself. And, and that's, so I guess, I don't know if I'm making a very intelligent answer, but, you know, I, there is an afterlife of all of this. This in memoriam is my own personal memoriam, not to everyone, but to some. And there are, as I said, there are stories that I didn't um, tell as well, but in trying to think about what it meant outside of myself in this broader way, that, that's when I, when I was thinking about this sort of descent itself as the afterlife of armed struggle and how important it was to, to bring that to the fore and, um, and also to highlight you know, what ethno, where ethno-nationalism's politics of death leaves us if we can't re generate something beyond um, this kind of politics of death that it promises us. So the afterlife is also those of us who survived and who shouldn't feel guilty about surviving, but we did because even for the dissenters, the most honorable thing, you know, so people celebrate my mother because she died, but she was, she did all those things when she was alive and she shouldn't have died. And she, the, her death is the most shocking and well-known thing about her. But the most amazing thing about her was who she was when she was alive. I think that's, I think you, you just brought us home, as it were, um, in, in, in your last formulation. I have uh, Vilashini next and uh, Chinaya Rajesh Kumar after Vilashini. Go ahead, Vilashini. Thank you. Thank you, Sharika, for this beautiful and, and fierce, as Anjali said, talk. Uh, and thank you, Indrani and, and Anjali, because you have you have each asked questions that I was quite interested in. One, uh, Indrani, the question of, of, of what it means to find the intimacy of dissent in this different structure of kinship right, that you formulate so beautifully. And it resonates with things like Robin Wiegman's notion of critical kinship. It resonates with people writing about queer kinship as a different structure of national formation. I, there's a lot to say about that. I think it's um, really rich. Uh, like Anjali, I'm interested in the genre that you adopt here, this turn to the auto-ethnographic and, and would love to hear if you want um, some of your thoughts about why you took this on, why this particular project called to you, what, uh, what the future of the auto-ethnographic is for you. Those are two uh, uh, echoes of Anjali and, and Indrani. The question I, I think I most want to ask you though has to do with, with the politics of afterlives and memory, the in memoriam and the memory within it. So for example, I think you, you, be, you lay out very beautifully under what conditions political cultures of dissent have to sit with the dead, right? Have to talk with the dead, have to, you know, as, as Derrida might say, but how that has to be linked to a politics of futurity, what you so beautifully call, you know, your mother's life or the afterlife of descent or something like that. So I'm really interested in, as I think a lot of people are, who think about the purchase of spectrality as a way to think uh, uh, the political, right? That it's not simply a kind of uh, memorializing of atrocity, but actually has what uh, what Peng Chea calls a becoming, an insurgency, a future direction, right? So uh, can you maybe talk a little bit about the kinds of temporalities, memoriam and memory, futurity, the futurity of speaking with and to the dead, and why that is, um, why that, that kind of um, oscillating temporality between looking back and looking forward is so important to engaging what Anjali has called the afterlives of dissent, which I think is a great phrase. I hope that's clear. <laughs> Oh my goodness, Vilashni. Sorry. I think, I think you should write a book about this. Sharika, <laughs> <laughs> I also want you to say that you don't have to feel responsible for the questions to answer no. them fully. 
I think we're all just moved yeah. and engaging with you. So you can just say that's, you know, I, I need time to think. So don't no, of feel course. like you know, this is this is a sharing. And I think Vilashini's question is 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 about, you know, all of the questions you're raising for so many of us. So whatever yeah, any you, need, you can talk about any of them. Oh, and I forgot so to say who I was. <laughs> Well, actually, it was so brilliant. I started taking notes very, very seriously. <laughs> I was like, oh, maybe I should be doing all of this. This sounds so great. Um, I think you are doing it. I think this this what the beauty of the form you have you have invented for this is doing. And so I think I'm just asking, can you can you tell can you unpack this this, as Anjali said, lyrical form that is doing all of these these things um did maybe you didn't know you were doing them until you wrote in this way i mean i think that i mean um yeah i sort of in, i do have some thoughts about that though i will have to confess i i wrote it initially in a kind of bulldozing through kind of ignorant fashion like i have to write it out and then i sent it to three people maura my father and my partner who were like oh yeah it's, it's okay so i was like okay but I did have um, I did have a modality, and I, I have thought a lot about uh, about this question of ghosts and specters and how we speak to the dead. And it's partly because I mean I, I think there's some things about it that come out of Sri Lanka itself. So as I said, life in Sri Lanka's gray zone, the people who disappear, this extrajudicial state, and so on. It's about disappearing people out of existence. So they, you know that they exist, but they don't actually, they don't come, you know, if they're in a prison, they're there, but otherwise you don't know even if where they are, who they are. And this is a very common experience that people had. And it's something that, as I said, my, my father had until somebody could prove he existed, he didn't exist. But this is an overwhelming experience for, for Tamils and Muslims, um, you know, throughout the war from both the LGT and the state. So, Part of the, the thing about remembering and the spectrality was the fact that somebody had to remember you and to make sure that you existed. And in some of the, you know, and some of the families that I interviewed, they did this in, in different ways, right? So the most famous example that people talk about is women who refuse to wipe off their kotu when their husbands disappear. But, and that, that, that is one thing, but I, I, I did know, um, Komuti, who I talked about, his his vid widow Temeli refused to do that, and she kept a picture of him in her house. But in other ways, it's that you can't remember. You're not supposed to remember young people who died in Hindu ceremonies. You're not supposed because you're supposed to let them go. You can only remember those who have, you know, um, been um, married or who have lived a full life. But people still continued. So in all these ways because the burden of proof was always on ordinary people to, to do this work of existence, of remembering, of defined ways of things to do. And the way that my, my grandmother went to my father's, the police station said, I know he's here, you have to let me in, right? So these, I think, so there is something about, that is the, the effect of our, the political history from all the from the state and the ethno-nationalists that the, that burden of proof fell so it is a political task in so many ways to remember that people ex existed to remember them to refuse to let them forget and that's what i call about you know the, what, what is it to have a political mourning that both accepts that so much of it is this sort of politics of martyrdom that denies that has a there's a hierarchy of mourning, but at the same time to acknowledge that there is something really important about this. But the only way I can get past the hierarchy of mourning and the martyrdom is to imagine a future for Sri Lanka because it has to be, it can't be the person who said to me, oh well, Tamils have to forget about 1983 so that we can move on, or it can't be. Also, Tamils say, oh, yeah, the eviction happened to Muslims, but if they could just move on from it, we could just get along. So we, we can't do that, but we have to have some sort of, there has to be a future where they, these things have a place, right? And I, and I didn't want to jettison, in, in my, I didn't want to jettison these, these acts of remembrance that people do, including my own um, family, um, because I, of... Yeah. Thank you, Sharika. I think that 
I'm very much appreciative of your feeling your way through the idea as you are thinking with us. And I think that's what we are all sort of um, responding to. So, you know, I think in such vivid ways. Um, Chinaya Rajesh Kumar, and then I have Janed. Like I'm smiling like this because this is my periapa, my uncle. Okay. I'm her uncle. Hey. Hi, Sha Sharika. Hi, uh, Rahul. <laughs> hi. Uh, thank you for this um, excellent uh, presentation that uh, I really enjoyed uh, and sad as well. But uh, my question is, I was a bit confused. But you mentioned that uh, human rights discourse in the 70s was the right to take up arm, arms against the state violence or colonialism uh, or imperialism in the in the in, in the global south <laughs> what is your view and whether you know the the problem is uh, the state is still you know a state is a violent state anyway implicit and uh, explicit violence against uh, people in India or, or Adivasis and all those things happening and certain uh, groups such as Maoist groups, they take up arms and they justify those uh, actions in terms of human rights as well. Uh, also, you know, that is one question. The second question is, do you think that those people who took up arms in the, those times can be defined as dissents and then the dissents within dissents? In a, in a later stage. Uh, those are the two questions. Okay, well, thank you, Rao. And as you are exactly a person who participated in all these histories I'm talking about, I will start off by saying I love you very much. And I will also, and I don't, I have only openness to your question, but I also, I'm going to take I'm going to say there's an answer I have as an academic, there's an answer I have as a, a person who from the, from the generation after you, um, which is as an, as an academic, I, I do think that, um, not necessarily human rights discourse, but I do think that, um, um, that that's why I, I think so broadly about that generation in the 70s who took up arms and, and also what happened to them, the long life process. So not just what happened to them in the 70s, but what happened in the 80s and the 90s. And when I interviewed them, and that generation was always more than the LTT, as you know. You know, so the LTT was one militant group among so many. And the others looked like, you know, just normal conservative Tamil people. So what happened? What is it about their lives that they both went into this and they came out, then they, reenact certain kinds of structures seamlessly. So I was always interested in that. And I think that many of them would not necessarily call themselves dissenters. They have a lot of very painful memories and thoughts that, but most of the time, most people did not feel like they could talk about it as the LTT became more and more powerful and their own feelings about Tamil Ulam also got collapsed into into it. So I think it's a, I, I, I would, I do stand by that account, not necessarily of human right, rights as a kind of 70s thing, but about armed struggle and then what comes after as a relationship to that armed struggle, including in people's lives, and that the dissent that they experienced came out of that. That's not the, I mean, I think that part of what dissent was in Sri Lanka was shaped by the fact that the LTT eventually said that everything that they was against them was dissent. So they put a very powerful category of dissent where you could become a traitor for not paying your tax, for example. So that sort of warps some of it, but I think more globally that relationship to um, the, the emergence of human rights in, in all over the world in relation to armed struggle is, is, is one I would stand by. I think what you're asking me is what I think of armed struggle. <laughs> And there I'm going to answer you as a, as a, not as an academic, but as a person from a generation that came after your generation who took up arms. And um, 
your generation, you, my father, all, all of you, and also the generation that came after me who I interviewed. And I think that there, that's why my early work was very much on generation, because I think there is a different kind of location that comes out of that. Um, I, I'm from a generation which never knew anything but war. So we were born into it, we lived in it, we felt like the choices that we had were constrained by the choices that our parents' generation had made for us, even more so the generation that came afterwards that was in forcible recruitment. So not like, so whereas my parents' generation chose militancy, that was not something that people could choose so easily. It became a kind of alternative, like this is one of the things you can do with your life. You don't, it's, it's a very different sort of choice. So I think my view on armed struggle is really shaped by inheriting it as something that we couldn't choose, but that we had to live with and the consequences of what it did. And so I'm not trying to say from this, oh, this externalizes all across South Asia, but I think many of us who have experienced the effects of it cannot help but have thoughts about what it does to to us, to others, to um, human relationships, um, and to consequences. And I think we can, and it can never be this abstract principle. And that's where my mother departed from everybody because she departed from the idea that you could have an abstract thing that you could hold on to. And that would be what you were loyal to above everything else. And she decided, I think my sister put it very well. She said, her love shaped her politics, not politics, her love. So I hold by that. That's a lesson that she that she taught me that you should be able to change depending on what you actually see in the concrete around you. So I don't see a place for armed struggle in Sri Lanka, though I do see a place for determined resistance against the Sri Lankan state. But I know that this is a point that we can we can just. <laughs> No, thank you, Sharik. I do agree. With you. Um, I think I think some familial descent is very much um, in 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 sequence with our conversation. Sharika, I just want to say I have many people in chat who have privately said how deeply grateful they are, and one person said for a critical, humane Sri Lankan studies. It's regardless of whether you embrace that term or not. I just want to let you know that your words are echoing amongst a lot of people who do not want to speak but want me to convey that to you. So, um, so in the spirit of determined resistance, we're going to keep Sharika here for a couple more questions because I know this has been a, a kind of heavy but momentous and energizing talk all at once. So we have Janed next and Usha will ask the last question. Um, and Sharika and, and Navyu, three of them. And then, um, you know, and you have a mixed... Sorry, should I, go ahead. should I take all the questions in one go? Yes, I actually was going to suggest that in, in, the, in, the, in the benefit of time. Um, and then you can decide what you have the energy or interest to answer. And uh, we can benefit from the knowledges of our comrades here. So Janed first, Usha second, and Navyug third. All right, go for it, Janed. Well, thank you so much, Sharika. That was such a wonderful, powerful talk. Uh, I have a ostensibly two questions. Maybe it's only half a question, actually. Uh, so when uh, we're talking uh, of uh, dissent, you know, dissent, the, uh, you, with dissent, you're trying to disrupt existing social practices. That uh, disruption will produce a rupture and will lead to a, a revolution, hopefully, right? Uh, and uh, that in those social relationships that you're planning to change through this descent, of course, the family is important and people have already asked you questions about the family. Uh, but that family with the rise of ethno-nationalism, uh, then, you know, as you've been saying that uh, uh, the horizons of uh, descents are, are, take a different turn. It's sheltering memory, uh, then documentation, et cetera. Uh, I, uh, that's one of the, uh, so what happens to that revolutionary horizons uh, of uh, the, or the utopias of the earlier generation or of the earlier moment, not the generation, but of the earlier moment. And the second uh, question, which is unrelated, is uh, what, how do we understand what is happening in Sri Lanka in terms of the geopolitics? And I've, you know, it's a question I've always, I've been wanting to know what, what are some of the geopolitical uh, changes or investments in Sri Lanka at this time that has produced this moment and were producing moments like this in different contexts too. Uh, 
and if you can't talk about it uh, openly you can also email and you know we can email and you can tell me yeah Juned I think you're going to have to buy Sharika a long coffee to answer your second question so um Usha you're next Thank you thanks so much Sharika I'm always amazed at your ability to read out this kind present this material without crying yourself um I have a question I think we've discussed this a lot am uh, amongst ourselves um it's a question about what the Tal tamil elam means to generations to continue this conversation about afterlives and generations uh, in the tamil diaspora uh, you and i have discussed your ire at for example mia glorifying the tamil tigers um but the, do the tigers uh, they turn into a black panthers kind of figure and this you know ties in with discussions of martyrdom etc and i'm i'm wondering if you want to talk a little bit more about what um what these kind of histories of descent get kind of cemented into for a diasporic tamil audience that is many generations away and uh, grew up outside of sri lanka and they are using it to navigate other kinds of circuits of uh, race racial and ethnic violence in their own context right so so that the the tigers become completely separate from what they meant for you growing up in sri lanka from what they mean for them in the uk canada in the us etc um thanks again usha that's a wonderful reminder of the kind of conversations that often get segregated that we need to bring together um uh, navyug i see you and then my my comrade and co-director mayanti has one small question and then sharika you have a, a kind of as we say buffet of questions and you can answer whatever you want all right navyug and then mayanti Oh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Sharika. Uh, it was really an incredible uh, presentation and um, brought back so many sort of thoughts and memories. I know it was very much um, grounded in this location, but I think unwittingly it spoke to so many other struggles and concerns people have. Um, it, you know, I, I grew up in Toronto, and um, incidentally, I was in Toronto in May 2009 when the protests took over the Gardner Expressway and they shut down the highway. And I remember a lot of the feelings of anger and despair. So. uh this this brought a lot back um the question i have um actually was sort of asked ahead so you might not need to to answer it but because it spoke to my mind in such a large sort of canvas i was wondering does this work suggest a way to imagine liberation movements uh especially ones that are armed um that can escape this sort of descent into violence the descent into sort of paranoia surveillance celebrating martyrdom in that way is there a way to kind of rethink uh liberation struggles does it hinge on uh the horizon of the struggle whether it's ethno nationalist or socialist or religious um or is it inextricable from the the act of taking up arms and that the stakes become so high and in that sort of crucible of state uh violence this sort of dissent actually will will not be sort of tolerated and will be clamped down and then in the end as you, i think you already just sort of suggested does it mean a kind of de facto adherence to nonviolent struggles at large outside of sri lanka does it does it does it does it, does it go in that direction or 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 how would you sort of um navigate that tension thank you thank you navyug um navyug's own work of course on the current farmers protests is a very wonderful supplement to some of these questions and he spoke for us last year so i invite you all to also reach out and read the, everyone who's spoken has written wonderfully about many of these questions so this is a great way to learn from many people who are who are here with you, us today mayanti um you had a question slash comment please i don't see you so yeah um sharika i just wanted to thank you first um my head is spinning a little bit so i'm probably not going to be very coherent uh but i did want to ask you one of the things i was really struck by was just the small material objects that played a part um in in the presentation in not not actually not just in the presentation but in the um the archive of memory and the potential for politics of futurity and i was thinking about um your mother's letters um also the safe houses that your father would point out um the put through that you know women refused to to erase the pictures and so i was wondering if you could help us or help me i suppose think about 
the material archive um, of memory and therefore also of a potential future. Um, and the kind of the places and the, the objects through which the dead continue to speak. Thank you, my auntie. And, and thank you. Sharika, you know, take a few minutes and you can, there is no linearity of questions. So you can move through whatever and we let you have the last word. So okay. please go ahead. I'll try to answer well. So I think, let me start a little bit backwards. So thank you all for these great questions. And I do have to think about a lot of them. Um, Mayanti, on this last thing that you asked me of material, the material remains, I've, I've thought about that a lot because in Sri Lanka, displacement is a really huge part of what it means to be, for example, Sri Lankan Tamil or Muslim. So in fact, because Muslims were ethnically cleansed out of the North or Sri Lankan Tamils have been displaced more than once or twice, most of them in their lives. You know, there isn't this kind of sedimented archive of, of places and houses. There are things that people think are necessary to take when you become displaced, like, your school certificates or your, you know, um, so, that, so there's this, I mean, I think now when you say it, I realize I've pointed out all these objects, but actually the relationship to homes and objects is a very vexed and complex one in a very, in a, in a war that seems such comprehensive displacement. And even when it has the question of possession and dispossession is complex as you know, my Sri Jagadishan who's on this call, she's written about it in relation to the hill country, Tamils as well. And you know, when you live in places that you're not supposed to own, but actually are places you're making as your living place. So I think that I, I think I, there isn't a great archive. And that is the, and, and, but people think about objects, but many of these objects are in memory alone. I don't have that many photographs, for example, either, or many things. And when we left Sri Lanka after my mother died, we had to take, we could only take whatever we could pack into the suitcases. So, and we didn't know, we were like small children. So we were like, oh, what do we take? We took the most random things. Um, the, <laughs> so you don't, so that's what, it's constant movement and mobility and never knowing what you're going to take. It's just whatever at that time seems. And, and so that's, if it's anything, it's a, a, an archive of objects is an archive of displacement for, for many years. Now, I think it's a little different post 2010, but it, that, is the, that is what I can say in some ways. But, it, it, but those are nonetheless archives of love and attachment to objects in memory. Um, um, in relation to the question, I think both Navi and you and, my, um, you and Usha ask kind of questions that dovetail together very well. And Usha, I'm really glad that you asked me this because I have complained to you many times <laughs> that people will often refer to me in Sri Lanka, also lots of South Asian scholars who think it's the right thing to do. They will say, oh, Ulam. And they don't understand that I flinch from, I mean, they think it's the right way to refer to Ulam because Sri Lanka is a, is a nationalist and, and, you know, genocidal term. And so Ulam is a better way to refer to Sri Lanka. But Ulam is itself also, though not in its, not in its origins, maybe, or not in the 70s, but has become, is also an ethnically inclusive, exclusive term. It is Tamil Ulam. And that goes with everything that, so I also, I, I resist, the, I, I, re, I resist it when people want to make Ulam into something that they think is liberatory and inclusive. And then, because I think it comes out of precisely, as you say, a very different existence in which Tamil Ulam has circulated among the diaspora. And I don't think it has that purchase of that history in Sri Lanka, but people will never, it, it's so connected to the LGT. And you might be supportive of it for that reason and use it for that reason, but it always comes with a hyphen in Sri Lanka, <laughs> it can never float, float free. And I think you're absolutely right. And you know, Nami, you would have seen this in Toronto too. And this is something that I worked upon in my earlier work. In Sri Lanka, there are many ways to be Tamil. There's not just a one way to be Tamil. There are many ways to be Tamil. And you can be a traitor like myself, for example, and be a Tamil. You don't, it's, that part is not in question. What, what you stand for, what your politics are, what your family, your caste, all of those things come into 
play, but not your Tamilness. But in, especially in the diaspora, because the LTT was so effective in, in, in Sri Lanka, it was very effective as a military actor. But in the diaspora, it was very effective as a soft cultural actor. So like when I was there, the social worker who comes with you to interpret for you, for you when you go to your children's school, that's an LTT person who is also not entirely an LTT person, might be a business. I mean, so they were a very soft cultural actor in the diaspora for decades, and they defined what it meant to be Tamil. And so to for a lot of young people that I interviewed, if you didn't, if that wasn't your frame of being Tamil, then you weren't Tamil at all. So one of the things that I always talk about is that, so the diaspora, in the diaspora, the, the, the kind of parameters of what it takes to be Tamil are much, much narrower. And it gets tangled up in questions of authenticity and our Tamil culture and our Tamil heritage, which is framed in a very particular way. And Tamil Ulam also comes out of that as a corollary. So there wasn't a way to do be Tamil and not accept that because that was rejecting your history. But that, but my point was always that was not quite our his, history. And that there was other things that were going on. And I think that there are things that are not given prominence, for example, in diaspora narratives, the fact that in you have big Dalit movements in France, for example. Oh, the knob, I mean, there's all these other fishes. And I think that is coming home to roost now, that even though you have this kind of Oh, we're all about Ulam. There are these other kinds of fractures around caste and class and diasporic location that are actually becoming ever more important, more openly talked about. And all of this in some ways is possible because the LTT is a lost object in a way. It's, it's like a nostalgic object, but it's violence. It's a, I mean, so it's, it's, it's a kind of paradoxical, it can re-emerge with this affluence because it's because its violence is in a way gone and that's why it can flourish. It wasn't like that immediately after the war in Sri Lanka, but the diaspora, for the diaspora, some of those pressures that Sri Lankan families faced where you had to give a child to the LGBT, so they were not there. So it's, it's a very complicated story and I'm always willing to discuss and debate with other people in the diaspora because I have a basic understanding that all of us have lost in some ways, and there is a lot of ways you can navigate that loss. But I think what's really important is show that there isn't a one way to be Tamil. You can be a traitorous, um, non, you can be a very bad Tamil like I am and be a Tamil. And I'm quite okay with, with all of that, you know? So, you know, that's why I, but, but it's not always offered. In, in that um, sense. And I, I come from a family of bad Tamil women, so I am totally fine with, with that. But I think for a lot of other South Asian scholars and activists who want to genuinely want to have solidarity and who want to connect to Sri Lanka, they also need to do their research and just dig a little bit deeper and understand that the LTT was an ethno-nationalist, not particularly left-wing force. That it will, you know, and it, in it. So I think that is the difficulty saying, okay, we have to get past this. And Sri Lanka is a heart of darkness for Indians. You know, it's like where Indian journalists want to come and do their war story uh, and make the create, <laughs> and it has been consistently a heart of darkness now over many journalist stories. So I'm just begging that people just do their work a little bit, bit, bit more because they're not a heart of darkness in that sense. Not that anyone should be, I, I'm using the wrong thingy, but you know, and that's why I enjoy having conversations with many of you and with Usha because it's about getting to a different place, actually. And you know, who and part of that is acknowledging the story about India and India's role and the geopolitics of India's interventions um, in Sri Lanka and currently now China's interventions in Sri Lanka. I mean, I don't. I, I, I mean, I think we're just like, I'm talking about debts to pay. I think we have a lot of debts to pay in Sri Lanka. And I don't know if, if, we're, if we're going to be ever able to pay back what we owe the Chinese for the harbor, the city, the port. I, I, we can't even, the government in so much in debt, we can't even unload the container ships in the port right now, right? So, I mean, it is, it, it's gone beyond geopolitics and it's just credit debt relationships. Um, at the at the moment, at the moment, um, I think. Let me try and 
finish on the question of what are the horizons um, in the future. I think that we're in a very difficult time at the moment in Sri Lanka, where survival has become in economic and in political terms has become the preeminent um, thing really. So what are the, the horizons that I see that could be a liberatory force are the ones of this politics of, of life. And it's something that informs my futurity because it's okay to be depressed and despairing about a country that's not your own, but when you are from there, you have to hope that there's something better all along. Um, and, you know, to, in response to, uh, you know, now you your question about what is it, is it about armed struggle, is it about the particular LGT, is it a dissent? I think the story from Sri Lanka is very complicated. I think that it cannot be a, dis a story only about the dissent into violence because the LGT from the very beginning, because political form matters. There were other groups that had a dissent into violence. But the LTT was a military force from the very beginning. Every other group had a consciousness raising group attached to it. Plot had one, the EPRF, I mean, they all purged. The LTT never had consciousness raising to it. It was very successful because it was only military. And it maybe had had people, including people I know and love in the early years who thought it was going to be more than that. But its fundamental core was a military organization and it carried out its mission like that. That's what my mother said. One day the LTT will go to its own demise, smeared in the blood of its victims. It was on the wall always. She said that in 89, she wrote that. She was absolutely right. She said they'll never love, they will kill themselves out. That was always on the wall. So they're not a good metaphor in a sense. They're a good argument for why we should pay attention to political form, not just the cause. Like, who, who, what is this organization? What is the thing that they're doing? And when I interviewed XLTT Carters, they would say things like, I interviewed a friend of my uncle's and he said, well, you know, what we asked was like, who is this organization? What is it doing for, what, what a future does it have for us? That's the questions we could ask. And Carters did ask that question in the early years. What is this organization? I think we should ask those questions still because the cause is one thing, but it does matter the form and the modality in which you enact those causes. And that's in Sri Lanka what we think about all the time. Okay, you have this commitment to armed struggle or liberation or revolution, but what are the modalities in which it emerges? And can we ever walk away from the history, what those modalities left us with, right? So look, and the JVP is in parliament right now, and it has become a parliamentary party. It doesn't do violence anymore. It, it says it just hasn't offered an official apology, but it is in parliament and it's elected. So, so, I mean, we think about that. Okay, so does this mean the JVP should be voted for or not voted for because it had this past? And I, so it's a very living question. I don't have an answer, but I think it's a really important question that we, ha we have to think about in relation to both form as well as content and have a kind of very clear sighted vision and learn from our histories too, if that makes sense. Shall I end? Yes, I mean, I wish we didn't have to, but I think we have um, taken a lot of your time. And, but I like the way you ended Sharika because in many ways it captures some of the, the hope I had behind curating this series was to think about dissent both as an aspiration, a cautionary note, but also a kind of romantic genre that, that we embrace through certain memorialized histories like that of the LTT or the Dalit Panthers, et cetera, and how sort of di divergent views of that vision are rarely accommodated or spoken of. So I think you've, you've, you've started us off in a, in a rousing and energizing and, and a beautiful way. And I hope that many of us can continue these conversations. Before I let Sharika go and before I let all of you go, please sign up for our next event. And there are many who raise their hands. I apologize. We only have a limited amount of time, but please reach out to Sharika if you have more comments. Um, Sharika, I'm sorry, I'm offering up your uh, attendance, but there's so much enthusiasm in the audience that I don't want them to feel as if they cannot reach out if they have to.
Please join us again in a couple of weeks for our next event with Gauri Vijay Kumar. We will continue some of these questions, ask more, and we hope to embrace this gathering and continue its iterations in a different form. Be well and Jai Bheem, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>